In this video, I'd like to discuss the last remaining piece that we need in order to be able to write down Maxwell's equations. And that is the Ampere-Maxwell law. And I'm going to start by, I'm going to start with Ampere's law. And I'm going to show you that Ampere's law um, ha creates a contradiction. And this is a contradiction that we need to uh, solve. So here's Ampere's law. And remember, it, it basically gives us a way of uh, finding the magnetic field. Due to a current, we create a closed path. And we look at how much current is passing through that path. Um, and remember that the closed path, we stretch a, a soap bubble across the, the path, and we look for the currents that pierce that soap bubble. OK, so now let me show you how this gives us a contradiction. Okay, so here I've drawn a parallel plate capacitor. And let's say we have a current I um, going in one side of the capacitor and a current I coming out of the other side. And as we discussed before, there's an electric field between these two plates, but there is no current between the two plates. Okay, now I'm gonna draw my Ampereian loop. And I'm gonna draw it so that I create a disk that cuts through the middle in between the two disks, in between the two uh, parallel plates in the capacitor. So this dashed circle that I drew is the Ampereian loop. And then this surface is the flat surface whose boundary is the loop. Okay, so the loop makes the boundary of this surface. And so this is the closed path that we're talking about up here in this equation. And so now how much current pierces this surface. And since there's no current between the plates, then the answer is zero. So I inside equals zero. And therefore, we can conclude that B is zero, at least along this dashed line, B is zero. OK, so a straightforward uh, application of Ampere's law gives us that the magnetic field is 0 outside of this parallel plate capacitor. But the surface that we draw that includes the loop as its boundary doesn't have to be a flat surface. And I talked about this in an earlier lecture. I can stretch this. You think about it like a soap bubble. I can stretch this thing out wherever I want as long as it has this loop as its boundary. So for example, one of them that I drew in a previous lecture looked like a basket. Okay, so I could draw a basket-shaped um, uh, surface, and the rim of the basket is the Ampereian loop. And Ampere's law still works in that case. Um, well, sort of. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a mathematical theorem that uh, the shape of the surface doesn't matter. Okay, and so we're going to use that and see what happens in Ampere's law. OK, so I've redrawn the situation. Uh, but now I'm going to stretch the surface out like a soap bubble. And I'm going to kind of make it look like a basket again, maybe a, a shallow basket. So this is my surface now. And it's on the back side as well. So it's like a basket where this dashed line is now the rim of the basket. And what I should have said earlier is that Ampere's law should work regardless of the shape of the surface. Let's see if it does. So now that I have this surface, how much current is piercing the surface? Well, clearly this current is, is piercing the surface. This one's not, but this one is. So now I inside is not zero. So B is not zero. And there's our contradiction. In one case, with one surface that we drew around that, that connects the loop, we got that the B field is zero outside of the capacitor. And down here, with a different surface that we drew, we got that B is not zero outside the capacitor. Again, we're finding B along this Ampereian path here. So we've arrived at a contradiction because B should either be zero or non-zero. It can't be both. 
So the question is, which is it? Is it zero or non-zero around the capacitor? And the intuitive answer is that it should be non-zero. And the reason that's intuitive is because we know that these currents produce magnetic fields around them. And so it would be kind of strange if we had a magnetic field along all along the entire length of this wire and then the magnetic field vanished for this little space and then came back. For one thing, the current here should be creating a magnetic field. I mean, this point up here is not that far away from this current, this right here. It's not um, directly uh, above it, but it, it's still not very far away. So we would expect that, and same with this current, we would expect these currents to still be affecting the magnetic field in this region. So how do we solve this contradiction? And that's where the genius of Maxwell came along. Uh, he was a Scottish physicist uh, working in the uh, latter half of the 19th century. His full name was James Clerk Maxwell. And this was his idea. He knew about Faraday's discovery. Uh, Faraday's discovery came in the first half of the 19th century. So he knew Faraday's law, which in a nutshell tells us that a, a changing magnetic flux creates an E field. And he asked, maybe could it be that a changing electric flux creates a B field? So let's try this in Ampere's law and see what happens. Okay, back to the parallel plate capacitor. Um, if we have conventional current coming in on this side and leaving on this side, then this plate is getting more positive while this one gets more negative. So the electric field in, in between the capacitors points to the right. And we've seen this before when we've studied capacitors and we know that the electric field strength in between the two plates is pretty uniform. No matter where you are in between the two, it's pretty, pretty much the same uh, magnitude. Now, if this situation hasn't reached the steady state yet, then that means this capacitor is, this capacitor is still charging, which, which would imply that the charge on this side is growing and the charge on this side is shrinking or becoming more negative. This is becoming more positive, more negative. And so if, these, if this amount of charge is changing, then the electric field strength inside is changing. Okay, so this electric field strength is changing with time if these plates are uh, being, if this capacitor is being charged, meaning these plates are becoming more charged. Uh, and the same ar argument holds if the uh, capacitor were discharging as well. Either way, charging or discharging, if the charge on the place is changing, then we would expect the, e the strength of the E-field in, in, in between to be changing. So let's find the, mag uh, the electric flux this time. Okay, let's find the electric flux. So we're gonna draw a surface right down the middle. Okay, so we're looking at a side view here, but imagine that this is like a rectangular sheet uh, and we're just looking at it edge on, okay? And it's inserted in between the two plates. And let's orient this uh, rectangular sheet so that it's normal as to the right. Okay, so you see that the normal <clears throat> and the electric field are parallel. So in our formula, this is the same formula we've seen for the magnetic flux where I've only just changed the E to, the B to an E. Okay, and this is over some surface. And since E and N hat are, um, are parallel, then E dot N just becomes the magnitude of E times the magnitude of N hat times the cosine of the angle between them, which is zero, so that's one dA. And the length of a unit vector is one. And then as I pointed out, the electric field is uniform inside these plates and between the plates. So it doesn't vary over the surface. So I can take it out of the integral. And 
And so I end up with the electric field times the area of the plate. Um, here we're assuming there's no, uh, there's a negligible electric field outside of the surface areas of the plates. So the flux is going to be contributed only in between the plates. And so it's the area of the plate where the electric field is non-zero. All right, and we've seen previously that the electric field inside a capacitor is one over epsilon naught times the charge over the area of the plate. So I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna plug it in right here. And you can see right away that the area of the plate is gonna cancel. And so the electric flux is just the charge on the plate divided by the constant epsilon naught. Now, if we're emulating or working by analogy from Faraday's law, what we'll need to do next is take the time derivative of the flux. Because again, that was Maxwell's assumption. We already know that a changing magnetic flux creates an E field. And so now does a changing electric flux create a B field, right? So let's find out by taking the time derivative of this electric flux. And now this is one over epsilon naught is a constant I can take out of the derivative and I'm just left with dq dt. But you may recognize dq dt, the change in the amount of charge per, per time, that's the current. So the change in the electric flux is the current over epsilon naught. And so this would imply that epsilon naught times the rate of change of the electric flux is equal to the current and would be measured in amperes. So now let's add this into Ampere's law. Wherever we see current, we're also going to add the, a contribution due to the changing electric flux. So recall Ampere's law. It tells, that the, tells us this path integral of the magnetic field around a closed path is equal to mu naught times the current that pa passes through the path. And so now to this current, we're also gonna add this other current-like thing. And so we end up with mu naught times, not just the current inside, or the current that passes through, uh, but also this contribution from the changing electric flux. All right, and so this is called the Ampere-Maxwell law. It's Ampere's law with Maxwell's correction. So was Maxwell right? Is this a correct uh, modification to Ampere's law? And interestingly, in his time, they were unable to test this um, because it's, it's very hard to test a, uh, a changing electric flux when you've also got a current nearby. Um, and so it wasn't known right away whether this works or not. Uh, but interestingly, the most compelling evidence that Max Maxwell was right comes from the predictions he was able to make about electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so we're going to cover that in the next lecture video. But first, let me write down Maxwell's equations. Okay, so here they are in all their glory. So we have Gauss's law. We have Gauss's law uh, for magnetism. We have Faraday's law. So these three we've developed uh, already. Um, and then we have Ampere's law with Maxwell's correction. Um, here, uh, the flux has been um, written out in its full form. Um, but this is phi e, this is phi b, this is phi b, this is phi e. So these four equations tell us everything that we could want to know about magnetic and electric fields. Now there's one more equation that we should add, which is what do these, how do these fields affect charges, which ultimately is gonna be what we measure. And for that, we have the Lorentz force law, which is a combination of the two force laws that we've seen already. So 
for remember for electric force F equals Q times E and for magnetic force F equals Q V cross B and so if we add these together then we have the total force for both including both electrical and magnetic I can factor the Q out as well then the total force is Q times the sum of E plus V cross B. And that tells us how charges are affected by electric and magnetic fields. And there you have it. This is a complete picture of electromagnetism. And in a lot of ways, this picture was really the ultimate goal in our course. We've been building up to these equations all semester. Um, and now everything that we have discovered and understand about electromagnetic behavior is summarized right here and in a fairly compact form. Um, <clears throat> and there are even more compact forms. Um, there are ways of writing all four of these equations in a single equation, uh, which is pretty powerful if you think about what that entails, which is that a single equation tells you everything that we would want to know about magnetic and electric fields. And one reason that this was such an important discovery in the history of physics is that Maxwell was one of the first to ever unify um, what seemed like different phenomena down into a single idea. So this is kind of the beginning of unification, which is a, a, um, an endeavor that continues to this day, which is to unify all of physics down into one master equation, if that's even possible. Okay, so this is it. This was our ultimate goal in this course. Now we have one week of the semester left, and with that week, what we're gonna do is we're going to apply these equations uh, in a really cool way, which is uh, another thing that Maxwell did. Um, and so that'll be the topic in the next lecture.